It's uh, my pleasure to, to join you and introduce our final speaker for this morning. Uh, if you don't know yet about a whole bunch about, about quantum, you're in for luck, uh, you're in, in, in for a bit of a surprise here, that the world's three foremost experts on the topic are with us this morning. And our, our final presentation this morning is the quantum effect, how BC Tech is changing the world. And you know, there's others around the world that are talking about building quantum computing about exploring it, but the fact it's already done here, it's commercialized, and I hear they're, they're selling to, to, to Google and NASA already, Don. And, and many other companies uh, are coveting what, uh, what's going on here in BC. Well, let's get to it. Prepare to be blown away. Up first, please welcome Jeremy Hilton, Senior Vice President of Systems at D-Wave Systems. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have the, uh, the pleasure of kicking off the session on quantum computing and quantum information. It's a short, punchy talk, so, uh, so I'll get you to pay attention. Um, if we can pull the slides up. In a moment. Well, maybe I'll get started. Um, my clock hasn't started running down, but I know we're starting to run into lunch, and I'm sure all of you are hungry. So let's get going. Um, to start off, here we go. And advance. OK. To start off, I'll take you back to the beginning of the last century when scientists were looking at the rules that govern the behavior of things in the very, very small limit. And they started to realize that those rules were fundamentally different from the things that our experience in the everyday is based upon. Scientists like Planck, Schrodinger, and Einstein were laying the foundation for what we now refer to as quantum physics. Later on in the 60s, a physicist named Richard Feynman extended these ideas with the notion that if you could leverage these quantum mechanical effects for information processing, then you could start to solve problems that were otherwise unsolvable with classical approaches. I'm going to, I'm going to play for you a quick video put together by our friends at Google that outlines some of what, uh, what goes into quantum computing. So go ahead. Quantum physics puts everything into question. It defies every intuition you have about the natural world. Quantum is a very strange regime of physics. Things can exist in this state of superposition where they could be like ghosting on each other, where they could be this and that at the same time. Entanglement. Quantum entanglement. Two objects, if they're quantum mechanically entangled, are still strongly related to each other, even though they can be a vast distance apart. With the notion of the multiverse. There's a whole family of Hartmuts in different states and then going through different experiences and different life trajectories. The famous one is quantum tunneling. 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 Tunneling is the slippage between universes. For a long time, people thought those effects only existed in the microscopic domain. Like uh, atoms, electrons, photons. But really, it's the theory of our universe. So if you want to build a quantum computer, you want to incorporate those new phenomenon into information processing. Maybe quantum computation is one of those instruments that's going to allow us to see quantum effects at the human scale. Google and NASA have teamed up to share one of the world's first commercial quantum computers. This machine, made by Canada's D-Wave, will be installed in a NASA research center in California. So now you understand everything about quantum computing. But it turns out it's actually really hard to build these things. So for D-Wave, you have to represent and solve an intractable problem, leverage the physics of superconducting materials implemented in semiconductor manufacturing facilities. We have to develop advanced cryogenic engineering so that we can cool the quantum processor to about 180 times colder than interstellar space, reliably. And we have to package that in a system that can run in a data center with nothing other than chilled water and electricity for facilities. 
We've managed to do this, and that's why Google and NASA were talking to us. So, so let me take a quick second to explain how the D-Wave quantum processor works. So you think of this as a, uh, a search problem. In the example of D-Wave's most recent product, the D-Wave 2000, the, it's a massive search problem. There are about two to the 2,000 possible states that you can represent. So uh, that's about 10 to the 600 possible values. We load that problem into the quantum processor and turn it into a kind of an energy landscape. And now in the landscape, the, the good solutions to the problem that you're looking for, uh, you can think of as low-lying states in this space. So you're looking for low valleys, and, and uh, you want to end up in the lowest parts. Classically speaking, when you deal, this is, this is a simple three-dimensional picture of, the, of this. In reality, the problems are, are, are many dimensions, two to the 2,000 dimensions in this example. But for our understanding, we'll keep it 3D. Um, classically, the only thing you can do is pick a random place on this landscape and then run downhill as fast as you can and then do that over and over again. Uh, and the search space is so massive that that's why this is an intractable problem. You can, in many cases, just never find a good or optimal solution to these problems. For D-Wave's quantum processor, the, uh, the approach is very different. We start off in a superposition of all of the possible states and use these quantum mechanical effects like entanglement and tunneling in the multiverse, as Hartman Nevin likes to refer to it, to, to find good solutions, to find low spaces in the landscape, as if it's like water flowing over land. And we can use that to come up with uh, many solutions or even, in some cases, optimum solutions to the problem. So, uh, so that's all I'm going to attempt to explain in the short 10 minutes. Uh, so I hope, hopefully that was helpful. Classical computers are really helpful, but Moore's law is failing us. There are still a lot of hard problems that we can't solve with existing computing technology. Quantum computers have shown that they can solve many hard problems. And D-Wave's vision is to bring quantum computing to cloud services so that developers from different markets with different kinds of data can use the most advanced computing that exists to develop new kinds of applications, unprecedented applications, that initially will be better and faster and ultimately will be in a space where it simply wasn't possible before this existed. D-Wave has come a long way. We've had a number of product generations and a, a lot of great customers. And we have a number of application examples that have already been running on the technology. Things like radiotherapy optimization, protein structure uh, analysis, molecular search for drug discovery, uh, image recognition, uh, financial management, portfolio optimization, and quantitative finance, uh, blink detectors, uh, software verification and validation, um, uh, operations research and logistics, and fault detection. These, these are just some of the examples of, of applications that users have brought to the D-Wave technology. And I want to stress that these are all pre-commercial examples. Uh, but users from around the world are coming to our technology and bringing their applications because they believe that the technology is relevant for the real world today. We have uh, a top-tier list of customers and investors, including some fantastic local investors. And having been founded in 1999 right here in BC, We've depended on those investors to help us build this incredibly ambitious technology. And those investors and customers share the vision that quantum computing will have a profound effect on society. We still are a proud Canadian company at this point. And uh, the, as you'll see from the speakers following me, the, uh, there is a lot of exciting things going on locally right here in BC in terms of developing quantum technology, in terms of maturing the industry around it and where this is going. This is going to be significantly game changing for technology. In fact, um, I'd make a prediction that within five years from now, most of the people in this audience will be using applications that depend on the product of a quantum computer.
Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. That, uh, that, was, oops, that was faster than we expected. It was uh, a little bit of quantum entitlement right there, or entanglement, depending on your perspective. People are hungry. Uh, let's give it up for Jeremy and what the team at D-Wave is doing. They're doing some pretty amazing work. Uh, our next speaker on this uh, topic is uh, Andrea Adamasali. Uh, he is the scientific director at the Stuart Balsam Quantum Matter Institute and a professor with the University of British Columbia. It's my honor to introduce Andrea to the stage, uh, and, but at first I'd like to direct your attention to the screen for a brief setup video. Revolutionary research into the mysteries of quantum physics has led to some of humankind's most important innovations. Lasers that enable nearly instantaneous transcontinental telecommunications. The microprocessors found in computers and electronics. Solar cells. MRI scanners. The internet. Operating largely unseen at the level of individual atoms, quantum physics underlies many of the most spectacular tech breakthroughs of the past 50 years. Now, as our understanding of quantum systems accelerates, we are poised to invent unprecedented new devices that can track a single molecule inside the body, trace distinct neurological connections in the brain, or even reveal what's buried beneath our feet. We are literally changing the way we view the world and ourselves. We have learned how to create novel materials by directly manipulating individual atoms and molecules. Working at this fundamental level promises to unleash the full potential of quantum materials for the first time. The Stuart Blusson Quantum Matter Institute is advancing this research frontier, attracting top researchers to Vancouver. Our scientists are developing new ways of applying fundamental quantum physics to the creation of innovative technologies. We are exploring wonders like high temperature superconductivity, colossal magneto resistance, and other quantum phenomena, enabling next generation technologies like ultra high performance nanoelectronics and exquisitely precise sensors. Technologies that will take innovation in the telecommunications, computing, automotive, sustainable energy, and healthcare sectors to the next level. The Stuart Blusson Quantum Matter Institute is blazing a path to the quantum age, and we're just getting started. Good morning. <clears throat> excuse, me, excuse me from my voice, a bit of a call. I'll try to get my voice warm, warmed up as we go. Good morning, everyone. And I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the province for uh, you know, allowing me to be here today to represent the Stuart Blossom Quantum Matter Institute. What I'm going to talk to today about is uh, a little bit of, about the quantum world, and in particular, I'd like to focus on quantum materials. The, the reason why I like to focus on quantum materials is because these systems are becoming an enabling, enabling technology for the future. And what I also believe is, at this particular moment, we are on the verge of a technological revolution, a quantum revolution. And here in Vancouver, uh, in BC and Canada, we are ideally positioned to play a leading role at the global level in this technological revolution. <clears throat> let me start from the very beginning, though. Before I delve into quantum materials, let me start from the very beginning of, of quantum mechanics. And personally, I place the beginning in the work of Albert Einstein, 1905. That's when Einstein explained a very particular, very peculiar effect. The effect is called the photoelectric effect. You have light impinging on a solid. Light is absorbed by an electron. The electron is emitted, so you can generate a current by the absorption of light. This experiment puzzled the community for a long time, about 100 years ago, and is what gave Einstein the idea to come up with the hypothesis of quanta, light quanta. So that's where the 
field of quantum mechanics takes the name. So what Einstein's hypothesized at that time was that light is not actually just a wave, it's made of particles. This is what we now know as the particle wave duality. Each of these particles is called a photon, it carries a certain amount of energy. The amount of energy is called the energy quantum for light. And so this amount of energy can then be transferred to the quantum of charge, which is the electron. And so by absorption of one over the other, you can have the generation of current. I consider this a very elegant explanation, a very elegant idea, and this very elegant idea has become, in the world we know, a mainstream application. What I'm showing here is the case of photovoltaics. Photovoltaics, solar panels, light comes in from the sun, gets absorbed, generated currents, current that can be used by any utility we are interested in. Another application of a very same phenomenon is actually light intensification. We have we want to take an image in a dark environment, and again, using the photoelectric effect and the hypothesis of light quanta from Einstein, we can actually do that. Next, I'd like to move now from what was the beginning of quantum mechanics to quantum materials and the kind of re revolution we are witnessing today, the revolution we are on the cusp of. So by application of quantum materials to technology, we can actually improve, in a way, in, some, in a somewhat incremental manner, what we already know. We can go to more efficient electronics, we can go to higher density electronics, but we can also enable concepts and ideas that could, you know, could not be imagined just a few years ago. And we just heard from Jeremy and D-Wave, the idea of quantum computing, we'll, we'll hear about, more about that from Steph Simmons' talk later on, quantum computing and quantum information. What I'd like to emphasize is that when we are on the cusp of a revolution, often, we cannot really even imagine the most exciting application, the most exciting implication of what we're doing. So if I, for instance, go back to the invention of the transistors in the 50s, and, well, at that time, it could have been possible to imagine the development of personal computer, portable computers. But certainly at that time, we were not being able to imagine the birth of the internet, which basically fuels the world today. And the same would be for the case of quantum materials. Let me now give you a specific example of quantum material, an example which has been there for many years, superconductivity. What you're seeing there is a superconductor, a copper oxygen-based superconductor, which is flowing over a magnetic track. Actually, that very same track is outside, and if you're interested, during lunch, you can actually have a look at it. <clears throat> what happens in these systems is that a current, an electrical current, can be sustained without any loss. And at the same time, a magnetic field gets expelled, which is, you, which is why you can see quantum levitation. Just because of these properties, these materials can be utilized for many, many applications. In addition to levitation, you have MRI machines, are a widespread application of, of superconductors. You also have sensors, and more fascinating, quantum computing. In fact, the very name D-Wave comes from these materials you see here. The system showed up there is called a D-wave superconductor and was believed, because it's becoming superconducting at relatively high temperature, to be probably the most ideal platform for quantum computation. Let me now go into an analogy to try to explain to you what's the difference between the classical and the quantum world. And the two key words here are incoherent versus coherent. So in order to show you an example of an incoherent system, here is a traffic jam in Korea where you see cars coming in, vehicles coming in into an intersection, and all of their energy is actually dissipated and lost into the traffic jam itself. This is pretty much how conduction of charge in a classical world takes place. If I wanted to take it to the quantum world, well, I would have to realize a coherent situation. For instance, in the case of a highway, now you have flow of cars which are separate, physically separated for separate directions, and that allows you now to have transportation without any loss. Well, this is pretty much what happens in a superconductor, of course, in a different manner, but what you can realize there is the coherent flow of charge and information. Now, superconductors have been there for about 100 years. They are, in a way, an old technology, which is nowadays being employed more and more. The other problem with superconductors is that they, they require to be cooled down to rather low temperatures, and that makes it impractical for many applications. So the question is, can we push this field to produce and generate, can we actually tailor materials with more 
uh, uh, you know, easy properties to use? And the answer is yes. And in fact, we are witnessing almost every day the discovery of new materials. And one case I'd like to emphasize is the one that led to the awarding of a Nobel Prize last year. These, these three gentlemen have work, work, worked on a topic, which is a topic of uh, topological properties, so-called. But what I want to focus on is one particular material they discovered, topological insulators. These systems are insulating materials in the bulk, but they can carry a current on the surface. So the interface between the material and the, and the vacuum becomes now a device that can sustain a current. And it's actually a very interesting current because, as shown here in this paper by Marcel Franz, who is one of the faculty members at the Stuart Blossom Quantum Matter Institute, and one of the world leading theorists in this field, electrons on that surface, pretty much as cars on a an, an highway, cannot sustain any U-turn. And what that means, they do not sustain or they do not suffer any loss, any dissipation. So now, at room temperature, actually, we have realized transport with no dissipation on the surface of material, which can be used then for, for applications. So far, I showed you two examples of materials. A superconductor, the topological insulators, these are materials that nature has provided us with. But can we do more? Can we tailor materials? Can we do free printing with atoms, pretty much as we have heard with organs and other important uh, either quantities or, or uh, devices or, or materials? Well, graphene is such, a, such an example. This is a single layer of carbon atom. It's a very elegant. Uh, system is very, very strong actually, is as strong as steel, is a conductor, better conductor than copper, is uh, actually flexible, so you could imagine of making electronics, flexible electronics, flexible screen, flexible paper, is actually materials that was believed not to be possible, not to exist, but has been realized. And what is interesting now, this material has a very direct uh, industrial relevance. So there is now a global market for graphene, and this market is estimated to be growing to the point of about $100 million US dollars by 2020. Now, one property this material doesn't, exp doesn't express is superconductivity. And as I mentioned before, superconductivity, being also an old phenomenon, can be used in many, many different applications. So what we've done at UBC was to come in then with an approach which is that of equivalent to the 3D printing and place lithium atoms, the yellow ball you can see up there, these are the same lithium atoms of the lithium ion batteries, and place them in a certain specific location forming an ordered structure. And as we do that, all of a sudden the material becomes a superconductor. So what we've been able to do this way and what many people around the world have a technology to do this way is to take a pristine materials, modify it so as to tailor the electronic properties to exhibit whatever is needed for a specific functionality. Going beyond that, beyond superconductivity, one can take this sheet of atoms, can roll them up and form what is called a carbon nanotube. So a one-dimensional tube, which is a one-dimensional conductor, and then come up with devices which again are very close to the realization of the photoelectric effect which gave birth to quantum mechanics 100 years ago. Here is an array of these carbon nanotubes. It's called a carbon nanotube forest on a substrate, a silicon substrate. And li as light comes in, either from a laser or from a uh, sun, a current is generated. And in fact, this is not just a dream. It's not just a conceptual design. This is an actual device which has been realized at UBC in the Quantum Matter Institute by the group of Alireza Zanoje. And I believe you'll have the opportunity to hear more about this later during, the, during this meeting. Let me now move to the last topic of this talk. And the, topic of, the last topic of this talk is that of sensors, and in particular, quantum sensors. And so we all know that this is a field that could have implications in all possible areas of technology and, and, and life, and a direct impact on society. For instance, sensor for explosive. Uh, sensor for uh, insulin, so health sector, security sector. So sensors are extremely important. And what I'm showing here is a picture of my dog, Hunter, which I'm showing not just because it's my life companion, but also because if you concentrate on his nose, you're looking at a very sensitive device. And in fact, it's an extremely sensitive quantum device. So the sense of smell is again governed by quantum mechanics mechanical phenomena, in particular tunneling. You heard about tunneling before, and that's how that nose works. And so what I'd like to emphasize there is the field of, of quantum biology, which is growing out of that, but also emphasize that not only that nature, in many cases, comes there first, but that we have the opportunity 
by tailoring material properties and taking advantage, exploiting quantum mechanical phenomena to really increase the sensitivity of all of our sensors and devices. So we're looking, for instance, at detecting magnetic fields, very weak magnetic fields generated by the brain without any invasive technique, just from the outside with an appropriate sensor, or sensing a single molecule of insulin in the bloodstream. So these are the kind of uh, dreamy application we'd like to do. Finally, coming to my last slide, I'd like to show this drawing of a quantum acrobat. And in case you were wondering whether, you know, when I talk about a quantum mechanical revolution, quantum technology revolution, I'm asking you to, to make a leap of faith, and in fact, a quantum mechanical leap of faith. Well, I'd like to stress that, you know, this concept of a quantum revolution is not something that I'm, you know, it's something that we only think about here, but it's something that is, is uh, being pushed worldwide. This picture, this drawing comes from uh, the cover of The Economist, the last issue of The Economist. And what, what in the journal was actually being stressed, in that particular article is being stressed, is that quantum mechanics is moving from being something weird that we cannot perceive with our senses to something that we should make our world better. So the world that we actually perceive and we sense better. So I'd like to leave you with uh, a few considerations. The first one we already talked about, quantum materials are in itself and themselves an enabling technology. I'd like to stress something that was already mentioned before. Vancouver is a vibrant environment for the nucleation of the quantum hub. We have world-leading universities, SFU and UBC. We have a very active high-tech community. And, and this is all working together to really create the conditions for a quantum hub. We also have the Stuart Blossom Quantum Matter Institute, which really wants to play the liaison, be the liaison between fundamental research and the applied side, between fundamental research and the technology and innovation sector. So finally, as a last message, something I heard before today, I really believe the time is right. The time is right here in Vancouver, in BC and Canada, and in this particular case, to become a global leader in a quantum technological revolution. And with this, I'd like to thank you. Well, Andreas, thank you very much. So wonderful to see that British Columbia is the environmental center for, for the hub of, of quantum. And our final speaker in this subject uh, this morning is Stephanie Simmons as a Canada a research chair in quantum nano electronics and assistant professor at Simon Fraser University. Please welcome Stephanie to the stage. Today's computers use bits. A bit can be either zero or one. All computer tasks are carried out by flipping these bits. Quantum computers aim to change this by introducing qubits, which obey the laws of quantum mechanics. Qubits can be both zero and one at the same time, and everything in between. The laws of quantum mechanics will make quantum computers more powerful than today's supercomputers. When bits are upgraded to qubits, they can hold and process far more information, making tasks like searching on a quantum computer much faster. A team of scientists at Simon Fraser University, led by Dr. Stephanie Simmons and Dr. Michael Thewalt, are working to build a quantum computer using silicon, the same material as today's computer chips. Atomic qubits in silicon are fantastic. And in 2013, they set a world record with their qubits remaining stable for three hours. They are now building a larger quantum computer by linking qubits with particles of light called photons. Once created, a universal quantum computer will be able to perform certain calculations that would be otherwise impossible. Today, we're on the brink of unlocking a whole new class of technology. Quantum mechanics will soon revolutionize computing, communications, and so much more. Thank you very much, everyone, for sticking around. I know lunch is tempting, and I'm standing between you and lunch. But nevertheless, I think it's going to be worthwhile. Um, I'm here to talk to you about quantum mechanics and quantum technologies and quantum computing, but actually to remind you that this has happened before. When we've translated rule, uh, sections of physics, laws of physics, to the mainstream, we've changed the world multiple times over. And quantum mechanics is just the next in a long string of revolutions in that style that um, will change everything that we do. So, 
All right, so just to give you some basic examples, this started hundreds of years ago. When we first harnessed, harnessed optics, we suddenly got the ability to look at the stars and at cells. When we harnessed mechanical physics, we got the printing press and clocks. This changed everything. When we got thermodynamics, when we finally harnessed the laws of thermodynamics, figured them out and then brought them mainstream, we had, we had access to the steam engine and then later combustion engines. Of course, electromagnetism is exactly the sort of thing that you think of now when you think back to how quantum is, feel, how quantum is perceived today. Quantum is perceived as weird and funky and kind of off on its own. Electromagnetism was the same thing. Back in the early 1800s, people used to go to, um, just to go to public lectures just to see how magnets worked. So it was seen as weird, but now it's something that you plug into the wall to get electricity. So it's in that same sort of thread. The most recent in that kind of camp is harnessing laws of nuclear physics. And of course, which is mentioned a few times today is harnessing the laws of semiconductor physics, specifically understanding how silicon can be used um, to, to get massive amounts of computing power. So all of these things are hugely transformative and quantum is the next branch of physics that's going to go mainstream, so this is coming. And so I'm here to talk to you a little bit about one application of quantum physics, but all of these things weren't known ahead of time, right? So as was mentioned earlier, you can get some guess for what's coming before it comes, but you have to see how the whole thing plays out, right? When they first figured out a transistor, they figured it was actually gonna be best for a hearing aid. So you can see where things have actually gone. So quantum physics, the rules are a bit different. You've heard this multiple times. When we, when we talk about classical bits in comparison, these are the bits, this is just the bits according to the laws of classical physics. So when you think of flipping a, white, a light switch from zero to one, that is a, a classical object. And so a bit can only be zero or one. It can't be anything more than that, it's just exclusive. But for quantum physics, you can have zero and one at the same time. That is perfectly allowed according to the laws of quantum mechanics. So it's not just zero or one and both at the same time. It's actually a full spread of possible configurations. So instead of going black and white, you can actually think about having a quantum bit be any color in the rainbow, any color you can imagine actually. But it's more than just that. There are other laws of quantum physics that complicate the situation a bit, of course, right? So when you look at a quantum system, it can never report being in superposition. It can never say it's zero and one at the same time. It has to be, it has to report a classical value. So we can use this temporary weirdness when you're not looking at it, it can be whatever crazy state, but then when you look at it, it, it goes to either a zero or one. So what does this mean for computing? We talk about how this could really transform the way that we do high performance computing tasks, and that's absolutely true. So I'm showing you here kind of the ver the, a visualization of classical versus what's coming for quantum. So classical here, you have this red line. This is like the real number line. If you wanna think about eight bits, eight classical bits, it would have to occupy one point along that line. And so today's code, if you're performing some sort of algorithm, would be sampling from that particular configuration, just bouncing back and forth along that red real line. Maybe not bouncing, flipping between different bit configurations, because all of processing today is just flipping those bits. Now I show the square around it because that's giving you a sense of what is actually possible according to the laws of physics. According to the laws of quantum mechanics, you can access that full square. So D-Wave is actually fantastic, was the first to go in this space. So their state, they actually sample not just more than one classical state at the same time, but they sample from this larger quantum space. So they start off with a monochromatic picture and then it slowly evolves into the final configuration, which is the answer to their computation. Because remember, you can only get a classical answer at the end, so it has to snap back to the real line for you to measure it. So D-Wave was the first to go in this space, and already they're competitive, if not outperforming, existing um, computing systems, which have had 50 years of technological development, so it's absolutely astonishing. What we're doing at SFU is a little bit beyond that. We're trying to go through what's called universal quantum computing. Because of course, you can have any color in the rainbow and all of those pixels in that full thing can be technically a quantum, can be occupied in some different um, quantum state. So really, if you wanna build a universal system, we have to go for something that can access the full quantum space. And so that's what we're trying to build. It's going to be harder than what D-Wave has had to do. But nevertheless, the gains will be larger because we can access much more of that space. So to give you a sense for it, if you had 50 qubits, 50 quantum bits, you would have temporary access to a petabyte of data that you could process. 
and then you just measure it at the end when it collapses back down. So that's incredible, and it scales, um, it scales very advantageously. So I'm gonna give you one example. We've heard a whole bunch of existing examples of what quantum mechanics can do, but I'm gonna talk about chemical simulations because chemicals are quantum objects. So all of the electrons and all of the atoms that actually make up that chemical are quantum. So it doesn't look at all like the stick and ball picture. So if you wanted to simulate this and simulate how it interacted with so target, a, a modern supercomputer could do this okay for a small scale molecule. But as soon as you get to larger scales, like aspirin, which is displayed up on the screen, or anything larger, these things become exponentially difficult to compute because there's exponential amount of um, quantum mechanical configurations that you have to deal with, and classical systems don't scale very well. Some problems are so bad you would never actually try and solve it this way. It would take way too long, no matter how much supercomputing power you threw at it. So these sorts of problems are called intractable. Yeah, if you let your computer run for the age of the universe, you could have a go, but otherwise you're not gonna be able to attack it. So this is, of course, the classical approach, but because quantum mechanics has access to this larger space, you would be able to do this much more efficiently. And this, of course, it doesn't necessarily need to be more efficient at the small scale, but the point is it unlocks new opportunities. You would never try and simulate the larger scale systems with any amount of classical computing power, but you could try to do this efficiently using a, using a quantum processor. It actually opens up whole new possibilities as well. Think about simulating things like proteins, DNA, these sorts of things. When you're talking about simulating new drugs, these are the sorts of tools you will need to be able to do it effectively and efficiently without any approximations. So I'd like to thank Andrea for actually bringing up um, the, some of the other applications as well. There's sensors. Um, we heard a little bit more about some of the other applications um, from quantum materials. But I did want to flag, again, the, the current edition of The Economist because they have a great section on here. Technology Quarterly is all about quantum tech. And because this is coming, right? There's nothing we can do to stop it. The quantum revolution is on our doorstep. So it's kind of giving you a sense of where this is going to go, at least what we can see so far. So I would highly recommend taking a look at that. The other thing that they mentioned, they have a, a good article on quantum encryption. So if you think about from a defense agency perspective or just information security in general, having the ability to have unhackable encryption is absolutely essential. So quantum mechanics does offer this, and, and that's one of the other applications that we know of so far. Okay, so just to bring it back to the silicon semiconductor picture, we've seen exponentials before. Actually, our history, our recent history is filled with, is, is dominated by the story of a given exponential trend. And that is the trend of Moore's law. So a lot of people that would look at the earlier results and say, okay, well, yeah, we'd never be able to try that now, but give it 10 years, things get a lot faster. I'm sorry to say that that rule is at an end. So Moore's law, which has been the law that said that transistors have been having in size, basically, for the past, every couple of years, for the past 50 years, this has enabled the exponential growth in computing power that we have today. And it has been an absolutely phenomenal trend of 50 years or longer, where we've just taken transistors smaller and smaller, which has given rise to this exponential boost in computing power. But sadly, this is at an end now. So we have, you know, when we talk about conventional transistors, these kind of can be thought of according to the laws of classical physics, that approximation holds. But as soon as we get down to the 10 nanometer level, which is where we are now or where we're trying to go in the next few, in the next year or two, this is where it becomes incredibly complicated because we have individual atoms that are basically making up this structure now. You can count them. And if one of them's wrong, the whole transistor doesn't work. And that is because of the laws of quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics just changes the way um, these, these systems work. Specifically, quantum tunneling tends to dominate um, at these smaller scales. So this is sad because Moore's Law has been a great run for everybody, and most of the tech discussion throughout this day so far has been like the outcome of how Moore's Law has impacted, or rather the study of semiconductor physics and understanding semiconductor physics has impacted everything that we do. But interestingly, interestingly, there's a huge opportunity here because the very atoms, the very individual atoms that mess up these transistors are actually fantastic qubits. So this is what we use at SFU. So these defects, individual atomic defects in silicon, are actually some of the world's best qubits out there. 
So the world breakthrough of the year, uh, physics world top 10 breakthrough of the year that we had in 2013 was demonstrating that these qubits are actually world leading in terms of how stable they are and how, and how well, they're also atomically identical, so you can reuse them. They're easy to configure. And you have the entire silicon platform the entire semiconductor platform at your back. We don't need any exotic materials, exotic semi, uh, superconducting materials. So this is something that we're very excited about. And so to conclude, I just wanted to give you a sense of where this is going. So we've had another recent breakthrough where we now know how to basically build a quantum transistor in silicon. This is very new work, and we're working on building this and sketching a blueprint out of it. We're going to commercialize this. So we're going to have a universal quantum computing hardware company here in, in the Vancouver area, and we're going to be taking this mainstream. Because, as was said earlier, Vancouver is, it is the global hotspot for quantum tech development. D-Wave got here really early, and there's been an ecosystem developing around them ever since, and it's absolutely the, the, the time and the place to bring this mainstream. And just to kind of bring that um, to the, to the just let's bring it back to the semiconductor thing once more. The last time we harnessed a branch of physics, semiconductor physics, that a lot of the gains went to Silicon Valley. It was named Silicon Valley because it was a hardware hub. That's where they first figured out how to get transistors and silicon and all that whole scheme working. And so I completely expect that Vancouver will be the home of that if we continue to build this ecosystem in the way that we already have. Thank you very much for your time and attention.